And you can see some, uh, some of the drones. This time of year, you start to see more and more of those drones, which is a good sign. They're, they're needed for the mating, so it's good to see some of those. Ever since bees started disappearing in massive numbers over 10 years ago, bee researchers have been busy figuring out exactly what caused the sudden die-off. We still don't have all the answers, and we're losing more and more bees every year. Bees are kind of suffering death by a thousand cuts right now. My grandfather typically saw was about a 5% loss year over year. We deal with about a 40% colony loss year over year. Yeah, bees are dying. There's no doubt about that. And I would venture to say that this year, 2018, you're going to see a 50% loss in, in bees. Turns out it's not just one single culprit that's killing bees. It's a mixture of several interacting causes. Some large-scale single-crop agriculture can limit access to the bees' natural food supply. Some of the pesticides used to keep these crops healthy are toxic to bees. So that's honey. And a number of parasites, pathogens, and viruses are spreading fast within bee colonies. Cleaning out the cell. To better understand the interconnected relationship between bees and agriculture, we asked almond growers and beekeepers to walk a mile in each other's boots for a day. We were talking about fungicides a little bit ago. They depend heavily on each other, yet they know little about each other's daily struggles. The goal is always to get to almonds. With this job swap experiment, we hope to change that. Third generation grower Ben King owns these almond orchards in California. I see the future of California really focus around principles of sustainability and fair wages and being good environmental stewards. And so I've tried to make the investment out here to uh, illustrate that. His foreman, Blake Davis, manages the orchard. The only knowledge I have of what beekeepers do are calling them up, telling them we want this many hives and this is where we want them, then bringing them in and then taking them out. The rest of the year, I don't know what these guys go through, their struggles. It's frost damage right there. And Bo Christie, their pest control expert. I'm just excited to see, you know, how, how do you check for mites in a, in a bee box? That's what I'm really excited to see. On the bee side, their second generation beekeeper, Russell Heitkem. I think there's been a mistrust there between the beekeepers and the growers and, hey, there's not enough bees. Oh, you say that all the time. No, there's a problem, and it needs to be confronted now. Jason Miller trucks his bees all over the country. His family's been in the bee business since 1894. The thing that most concerns me is I don't see it being sustainable if we continue on this path. The hive monitoring is done year-round. And Ben Salman is a beehive management advisor. When I think of almond growers, I tend to think of someone who's, you know, they're going for maximum efficiency and more, um, the industrialized side. In this job swap experiment, each participant learns something new. Right we'll find out how what they learn can improve the health of bees and in turn benefit our entire food system. Every year in early spring, bees feed on California almond blossoms. As they eat the nectar, they collect one flower's pollen and pass it on to another. That's how almond trees are pollinated. Without that process, the tree won't produce any nuts. So without bees, large-scale almond production wouldn't exist. But the bees don't just show up out of the blue. They're loaded onto trucks and shipped to where they're needed. We're just finishing up with the pollination of the almonds, uh, loading the bees onto semi-trucks, headed to their next pollination event. Our bees kind of scatter from here. A few will go up to Washington to pollinate apples, uh, a couple thousand up north that way. And then we have some going into the prunes to pollinate prunes here in California. After that, everything heads to North Dakota on semi-trucks and our bees spend the summer out in North Dakota. It takes about 30 of these fully loaded semis to get all of Jason's bees to North Dakota. They have to be shipped throughout the country because there just aren't enough local bees to meet the increasing demand for pollination. 
The almond industry alone has grown from just under 450,000 to over 1.3 million acres in just 25 years. That means they need even more bees at a time when populations are stressed. To meet the skyrocketing demand, beekeepers have become experts at managing bees, raising and growing them to replace their losses. She's pulling out a larva. Russell's employees scour bee combs for larvae. They place them into specially designed cells that contain a highly nutritious substance bees make called royal jelly. Those are all the queen cells. In there. These are the queen cells. Okay. The cells person. are then placed into beehives, and in just 14 days, the larva develops into a queen. Okay, and so they've, they've capped it. You can still see that there's this white liquid in there. Yeah. And that's yeah. a little bit of the royal jelly that they haven't consumed yet. And so all you have is a, is a grub in there. Oh, actually, she's really forming into a queen there. Oh, yeah. Once the queens are fully developed, they're placed into new hives so they can lay eggs and make more bees. The new hives are created by splitting a larger hive and making sure the bees have everything they need to reproduce. It's got its feed, it's got its bees, it's got its brood, it's got everything it needs. It needs one more thing. What would that be? Queen? Food. Queen. It needs a queen. You got any queens? Those big bees in the cages are the queens. So we'll put that into this, this new made hive. They're placed into the new hive while still in their cages so that the hive has a few days to get used to their new queen. There's always a chance she may not be accepted, but the transition usually goes well. And then look, look how they go straight just go to right her. to her. Okay, She has this very strong pheromone. They are yeah. stoked. It smells like yeah. mom. It's very comforting. It's mom. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I was a kid, beekeeping was difficult, but there was a lot more peace of mind. And now I lose a lot of sleep at night. We don't have as much vacation time as we used to do because we're struggling to keep bees healthy all throughout the year. And that's a big change in my lifetime. And that started in the 80s with the the introduction of varroa mites, and those varroa mites have been kicking our butts for a long time. Russell's talking about that red bug on the bee's abdomen. Its official name is varroa destructor. It's a parasite that feeds on bee and larva fat. They not only physically weaken bees, but they also spread viruses throughout the hive, which can seriously cripple its ability to stay healthy reproduce and function properly. A lot of the mites are going to be under the, under the brood capping, so mm -hmm. the mite jumps in that, in that cell right before it's capped, mm -hmm. and then it starts to feed on that, on that larva, on the larva underneath the, the brood capping. I can capping. see the little larvas in there. Yep, you can see the little white. Ben Salman larvas. monitors the health of bees throughout the year. So if you'd like to try to take a sample. He's um, showing Blake and Bo how he checks for mites. Avoid scraping the and they're both beginning to understand just how much work goes into beekeeping. I didn't realize how intensive it was, how much was involved. I mean, I thought you just, you know, have some bees and you take them out to the field and there you go. But, you know, each box has to have a queen. Um, if they don't, the, the hives decline. And how much is involved with testing the bees for mites? you know, all the way from collecting the 300 bees to putting them in the alcohol water to shaking them up for a minute and putting them through a strainer to see, you know, how many mites come out. That'll filter the bees out. Treating a bug that's on a bug is pretty cool. Good news for Russell, I don't see a single mite here. Awesome. I'm kind of disappointed because I wanted to show you what a mite I looks like. But <laughs> Before we had these struggles that we have now, there were months that we could take off and we could relax. Now, no way. We take two weeks off at Christmas time yeah. and that's it. And in those two weeks, we're a little bit uncomfortable about the health of our bees and what's going on at that time. That's what my mindset was before was, man, these guys are making a killing on almond growers and living the dream the rest of the year. Yeah, no. But if it's just that thing I, I think I learned the most from this experience is how much the beekeepers go through to provide bees and their focus being getting to almond bloom. The checking and rechecking and, you know, the taking care of the mites and growing the queens and how much work is actually involved behind the scenes that 
as a grower, I don't realize and didn't know anything about. Last year, we had the issue with the um, oblique banded leaf roller. In the same way that Ben checks hives for mites, Bo Christie, the pest control advisor, routinely looks for disease, fungi, and pests on almond trees. If she finds any, the trees may need to be treated with pesticides or fungicides, and the timing can be critical. When it comes to diseases, especially in the almonds, insects, especially in the almonds, it's usually, we need to do this right now. And we're in there the next night spring. This is the insect that's causing the most alarm for growers right now. It's an adult navel orange worm. It can lay hundreds of eggs on developing almonds. The eggs pupate inside almonds that remain on the tree after harvest, in these black shells known as mummies. They spend the winter there, feeding on their almond hosts, and then in the spring, they emerge as adult moths. I know. Here we go, here's another one. Bo and Blake were able to find one to show Russell. Right there is the little navel orange worm. Yeah, so when do you typically, when is your first treatment or spray for that? The last few years, navel orange worm has been such a huge issue and there's been, you know, three to four generations to where we'll have to be putting a second spray out during whole split timing. So we'll go beginning of July, we'll go a couple weeks later, just so we're getting coverage on that entire nut as it's opening. Um, because these guys will go in, they'll lay their eggs right on the suture of the nut. They'll hatch, and as soon as that nut open, starts to open, they'll attack that nut. And basically do this. Yes. So you can have a 12-15% crop loss if you don't take care of this with sanitation, with some sprays and things like that. And, uh, you know, 15% loss is, is pretty big. It's huge. It's a lot yeah. of money. Treatment for navel orange worm isn't a huge concern to bee health because it's usually done in the summer after bloom when bees aren't around. It's the sprays applied during bloom to protect against fungal diseases that can be bad news for bees pollinating almond blossoms. So growers have begun moving their sprays from daytime to nighttime when bees are in their hives. That is when the, the bees are not foraging. When it's cooler, when it's dark, they are not out. We can get the spray on, let it dry before they kind of wake up and want to go to work. Um, that's what we're trying to do. A lot of growers there, they were pretty apprehensive about doing it, but I write it on my recommendations that we, we cannot be spraying when the bees are foraging. Spraying the orchards at night when bees aren't around is certainly helpful. But the long-term effects that pesticides have on bee health isn't yet fully understood. They don't really need to report that if it doesn't say that it's bad for bees. Russell recently experienced this firsthand. He had about 100 hives in a sunflower field. The grower used an insecticide that wasn't labeled as being bad for bees. Well, I had some bees in sunflowers, and almost every one of those bees died a couple months later. Right? So they're packing this contaminated pollen away, and then over the next couple of months, they're digging into that and they're feeding it to the larva and the larva's dying. And those things just slowly collapsed. And this was news to Bo, that some insecticides deemed safe for bees could be harmful to bee larva nesting in the hive. They'll forage on that chemical, take it back to their bee boxes, and they're feeding all of this, I guess they're feeding the pollen to the larva and they pretty much die. And my farmer, a friend of mine, he lets me keep bees on his property. He was doing what he thought was the right thing to do for bees. And he was spraying a chemical that was not supposed to be bad for bees. And now it turns out that it is bad for bees. And I have a couple hundred hives that are dead inside the warehouse with cone that has that pollen in there that they packed away with that poison on there that killed these beehives. And now, I can't use that comb anymore, I have to get rid of it. This may look like a picture-perfect orchard, 
and during bloom, it's a great source of nutrition for bees. The problem is that some growers eradicate all other blooming plants and flowers from their orchards. So after bloom, when there's no more nectar in the almond blossoms, the orchard essentially becomes a food desert for bees. See, this used to be what this lattice looked like before the trees were planted. So there would be clover in there, and that would be great forage for the bees. Our bees are starving to death, basically, and that's when you start seeing these viruses pop up. Their immune systems are, are weakening, and, and we, we can't control that. I can throw everything at them to try to keep that, keep that up, their, their immune systems up and healthy. But without natural forage, I'm struggling to keep bees alive. To do what he can to help bee health, Ben King began planting mustard greens and clover on his orchard, right next to the almond trees. It's called a cover crop, covering the ground in between the rows of almond trees. It provides an extra food source for bees while they're pollinating. It can boost their immune systems and help them fight off viruses. This is it. This is beautiful. This is, man. This is a beekeeper's dream right here, <laughs> let alone a bee. I think bees like it too, but beekeepers love it. Well, it's, a, it's, I mean, it's also a grower dream. I mean, you look down and... The seeds for this cover crop out. were provided for free by a nonprofit called there. Project APSM through their Seeds for Bees wow. program. It turns out that the cover crop also helps keep the soil fertile. What we're trying to do with the uh, cover crops is actually you know, use this, the, the surface area of the soil to capture as much of the sun's energy to create carbon, organic matter, that can actually be put back in the soil, improve the soil structure, and provide the right type of biosphere for all the soil-borne organisms. We've noticed an increase in organic matter, better water uh, penetration into our soils because of having this cover crop. And we've also noticed a lot more native wildlife that lives in there with from birds to hummingbirds and different things out in the orchard. There are some challenges to having a cover crop. During harvest, machines like this almond shaker need a smooth surface to operate. And then the almonds need a few days to dry on a clean orchard floor before being scooped up. So before harvest, the cover crop must be mowed and mowing hundreds of rows can take time. Another concern is frost during bloom. More cover means less sun hitting the earth around the almond trees, making the ground cooler. So almond blossoms are at a greater risk of getting frost damage, which can kill the developing nut. In my opinion, a pretty simple but Blake has found a way around that. You see a frost in the forecast, you mow it down. Because in reality for us, the most important thing as a grower is our trees and our crops. And to save that, if we got to mow down this, then we mow down this. And we're not going to get a frost event every year. So I, I got to tell you, that would be heartbreaking for me to see you mow that down. But I get yeah. it. You got yeah. to make your crop. And, yeah. and the benefit that they get before you mowed it is something. And then I think that it'll come back again at least somewhat, so that you could have a bloom after the crop too. Yeah, and, that's and, and we did beneficial. notice that too, is last year when we mowed this down to start getting ready for harvest, more was popping back up. It wasn't as big, it wasn't as thick, but we did still have flowers coming up and blooming after we went through and did a one pass with the mow. So you could, if you had an early frost, mow this down and then within a few weeks have more flowers out here again. Ben and Blake have also placed native plants along the orchard's border. Once fully grown, they'll provide a year-round food source for bees. After a few years, it'll be, you won't need to be running water. Right, it's all drought. All, all yeah. this extra forage comes at a cost. Some of it is offset by Project APSM's Seeds for Bees program. But the plants still need water and maintenance. Ben says it's about 5% of the orchard's budget. But to him, it's worth it because healthier bees will do a better job of pollinating the almonds. And investing in the cover crop is an investment in the long-term fertility of the soil. If, if we don't support the honeybee industry, obviously we're not gonna have the productivity for this industry. But if we don't support the honeybee industry to have overall health, what are we doing from diversity? And what are we doing for long-term fertility? 
of our climate. You know, California is so blessed with this Mediterranean climate. And 25 years from now, if we don't invest in the soil, if we don't invest in these diversity, biodiversity, you know, what does that mean for the future of, of even for the U.S. and for the consumer? Yeah, and you bring up a good point, because if the bees are doing well, then it means everything in the ecosystem yeah, is doing, doing well. well. The bees do well, then we know that probably most of the ecosystem is doing well, and then and us and, and our societies and, proof, and producing nutritious food is going to be there for generations if, if the bees do well. It's a symbiotic relationship, and it always has been, and it has to continue to be that way, yet it's more critical now because there's more production of almonds and there's less bees. There's definitely a lot of pressures on the bees. Um, you know, lack of forage is huge. The mites are, are a never-ending battle. So I would say the... The status of bees right now is precarious, but it's hopeful, especially as we start to adopt some of these better practices. Us beekeepers have gotten a lot better at rebuilding colonies, constantly rebuilding our number of colonies um, that we can maintain uh, our counts despite these horrific losses. I don't think we'll run out of bees. As long as you have people that are passionate about bees and understand bees and continue to study and change with the changes of beekeeping, you're always gonna have bees. But the struggles to keep healthy bees for an industry that is asking us to have healthy bees, and a lot of them, that's going to be our challenge. Almond growers have certainly been helping with this challenge. Every year since 1995, they've invested in bee research. Through the Almond Board of California, they've financially supported over 100 research projects, more than any other crop group. And they also support the Bee Informed Partnership, which provides guidance to beekeepers dealing with pests in their hives. There's a lot of opportunities for us to align our interests. When, when we start the dialogue, we realize there's a lot of alignment between the interests, but if we each are operating in our own individual silos and not having actually that... looking at the This problem. job swap experiment generated deeper knowledge and greater empathy on both sides. Whatever you feel like. More conversations like this could go a long way in helping bee health, the almond industry, and our entire food system. I realized that there's a lot of common ground. I've never met an almond grower who was so forward thinking and it's really refreshing to see. So that surprised me um, that he was so willing to work with the beekeeper and really do its best for the bees. It hurts the bee by, um, it gets in their digestive tract and it actually kind of- What I empathize most with the beekeepers is the fact that they can lose everything if they do not treat for, say, a mite, because that mite vectors a virus. It's the same thing in my industry where if I don't treat a thrip in, say, tomatoes, that crop is wiped out. It's just bridging that gap somehow. And yeah, and having us understand that too. I would offer a discount to a grower that was planting forage in between the rows of his trees because that's going to benefit me. That's gonna benefit me. It's also gonna benefit them. And, and ultimately that's the goal is to let them understand that, hey, this is not only benefiting me, it's gonna benefit you too. Naval orange worm, most often The next time I meet with the beekeeper and the issue of almonds comes up, I'll definitely mention that there are certain growers that are really pushing the limits of of sustainable practices in a good way. It's a bit of an eye-opener, and it, it tells me that as a grower, if we can do our part, even if it's a little bit, to help that health of the bee, then we should be doing it, because without those bees, we wouldn't have a crop. What do you call the fruit that's produced by that tree back there? Almonds. <laughs> we call the fruit on that tree an almond. Almonds, almonds, who cares? It all tastes good. It's good for you. <laughs>